I would like to welcome everyone to the September 9th, 2021 work session of the Henrico County School Board. The first item on our agenda is the approval of the agenda. Uh, board members, is there a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Ogman. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Kinsella. All in favor say aye. Aye. I'm opposed. The ayes have it. The agenda is approved. Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. You can see that our first item is one of recognition, particularly for our facility staff. But before we launch into that special award of which we have a number of special guests here with us for that item, um, I want to uh, shout out the first day of school, back to school 2021 yesterday. So we were so pleased to welcome students to the first day of a new school year yesterday. And while the first day did bring some challenges, it also brought tremendous joy and excitement as students and school teams were reunited in person. The phenomenal staff teams of 72 schools and centers worked double time, probably triple time uh, to have a great opening day. And I did have the chance to stop in and see our three newest facilities, facilities Holiday, uh, Tucker and High Island Springs as they open doors uh, to students for the first time yesterday. You can see some photos coming across the screen that show various snapshots of the excitement that was felt in those facilities, which also reflects the smiles and positive energy uh, that was felt across all of our schools yesterday. So as we take a moment to celebrate this new school year, I also want to share tremendous appreciation and gratitude to the entire Henry RICO team for all of the planning and preparations that went into ensuring a safe return to school yesterday. There are countless employees um, on the front lines and behind the scenes that uh, put incredible time, energy, and effort into making sure we had a smooth opening. And as I said, we absolutely recognize some challenges, certainly around uh, transportation routines and routes that we're working through. Cannot thank our entire team enough for all the efforts that went into to making a smooth opening. And I also want to thank our families, our students, uh, for their patience and understanding understanding and what is truly uh, an exciting but challenging school year. So your patience yesterday and throughout this week as we work on developing those rut routines is so appreciated. Um, and so while the obvious patients we know with bus stops and routing, it also is for some of our in-school procedures and getting things started for a new school year. So we, we appreciate everyone's uh, hard work and your understanding as we launch our new school year. And so one of the employee groups we want to give an extra special thanks and shout out to is our facilities team. And this is not just for the efforts in preparing for yesterday's opening day, but for ongoing efforts, particularly during the challenges that the pandemic has brought upon Henrico County Public Schools. So I'm going to turn it over to Lenny Pritchard, who's going to begin uh, this recognition item. Mr. Pritchard. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. Thank you for this opportunity to recognize our outstanding facilities team uh, for their, their continuous work during the pandemic. Just to give a few highlights of what they were able to accomplish during that time period, they maintained the buildings during the shutdown and provided access to the food service and technology employees. They set up the regional call center for the Department of Health and assisted with its relocation. They reported back to work in person on June 15, 2020. They provided thousands of hours of adjustments and repairs to our 500 HVAC systems and our thousands of exhaust fans throughout our 72 facilities. They fabricated over a thousand acrylic cough guards. They delivered thousands of pounds of masks, face shields, gowns, gloves, signage, tape, cough guards, hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer sprayers, and air purifiers providing countless hours walking to schools to determine the COVID readiness. This is just a few examples of what they were able to do. And at this time, if I could just recognize a few of the key members um, to help coordinate and make this all possible. First, we have Tom Wilkins, our acting assistant director, Joe Allen, our HVAC foreman, Roy Caulfield, acting architectural trade supervisor, Heath Locke, laid, Trabers, uh, laid trade supervisor, Carolyn Dickens, warehouse manager. Carl Brown, technical operations project manager. Chaz Tiggle, te technical operations technician. Jeff Groh, 
maintenance control supervisor, Jack Thornton, facilities coordinator, Wayne Curtis, facility coordinator, Andrea Tuck, custodial zone foreman, Shondell Watkins, custodial zone foreman, Michael Ruffin, custodian zone foreman, Hisham Gaddis, custodial zone foreman, and Marquise Derricott, custodial zone foreman. And of course, I'd also like to recognize Susan Moore and her outstanding leadership and, and our entire director of, of facilities and, and the entire team, both at our central level and at our school level. They've done an amazing job. On behalf of this, well, one of the things we want to do is recognize them with a special plaque and memorandum that will be in, in put up in our facilities warehouse down at the shop. Um, it's also custom made by our facilities folks. So it's just the amazing work that they do. So here we are with this, and I'll present this to Susan Moore. Thank you very much. And would there be an opportunity uh, for a, a larger group photograph? And I think uh, the chair and vice chair would come down and represent the board. And again, our deep appreciation on behalf of the entire school board and administrative team for your outstanding efforts. So I think we'll probably need to use both rows of the uh, platform there to be able to distance for the photo. Thank you. Yes. Before our special guests exit, I think some board members want to share a few words of appreciation. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll turn it back to you. All right, so to my right, anyone want to start? No, I, I just cannot thank you enough for all that you do, all that you've done, all that you do, and all that you'll continue to do to help um, our students and staff feel safe uh, in our facilities. Thank you for all you do. Thank you all for um, your work always, but especially these past 18 months, you have kept our building safe and healthy for our students to learn in. Um, we are just so uh, grateful and indebted to you for the work that you do each day and coordinating your teams as well. Thank you. I'll be real quick too. Um, two things, uh, having been a teacher in the past to the custodian folks, you know that first day when the, short, the floors are just as shiny as they could possibly be? The schools I've been into recently, they, the teachers are all talking about it. They're so excited to be back and see those shiny clean floors and, and the way the buildings look. And I was at Tucker on Tuesday and it was like a beehive of activity. So Susan, to you and your team of getting Tucker ready for students yesterday was amazing. And I'm sure Holland Springs the same thing, but, but we are just so grateful for what you do every day. The unsung heroes uh, of Henrico County. I just want to say everything from landscaping to lighting systems to cleaning and so much more. You keep us healthy physically and mentally. Mentally because it's comforting knowing uh, that you guys are there. Your presence by itself means a lot. And there are no words that can really for me describe how I feel about your service. More importantly about your attitude that 
you continue when others do not want to. You are always, always there. And it's, it's just deeply appreciated. It is because of you that we can. It's because of you that we can open our doors. It's because of you that many of us can sleep knowing that our facilities are gonna be clean, that we're gonna have light so that when we walk through the hallways, we can see. And so know that it's because of you that we can. So thank you so very much. I just echo the sentiments of all of my peers and the, the superintendent and just let you all know you're not unsung heroes, you are heroes. Um, we feel confident, we feel um, assured that our students and staff are in the best kept buildings, the safest buildings in the nation, and to you we tip our hats. And so thank you again, and I hope that you all have a safe and successful school year. Can we give one more hand for the lead? Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Again, thank you, Ms. Moore and, and, and Lenny for your presentation and recognition uh, of our facility staff. Uh, the next item on the pardon agenda. Pardon me, Chairman yes, Cooper. I would like to ask for opportunities for the board members to be able to share their thoughts about the first day of school as well, if they so desire. I also have some thoughts that I'd like to share about the first day of school. Well, we, we can do that, not at this moment in the agenda, mm -hmm. so we're going to proceed, but we can come back and figure out where we can do that. Sure. Thank okay. you so much. Yep. Next item on the agenda is the closed session. Um, th is there a motion to go into closed session for the discussion of matters covered under item A1 of section 2.2-3711? of the Code of Virginia as amended pertaining to the assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and release of contract for specific school board employees. So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Kinsella. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. We will now go into closed session. We will reconvene the work session at the conclusion of our closed meeting. Is there a motion to certify to the best of each member's knowledge only public business matters lawfully exempted from opening open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed session to which this certification applies and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session were heard discussed or considered in the closed meeting. I move that the school board certify by a recorded vote to the best of each school board member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from the open meeting requirements of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and identified in the motion of authorizing the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered in the closed meeting. It has been moved by Mrs. Shea. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Ogren. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The closed session has been certified. Madam Superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. For the first item, I am seeking the board's approval of appointments of administrative personnel. Is there a motion to approve the appointment of administrative personnel? So moved. Been moved by Mrs. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Mrs. Ogburn. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The administrative appointments are approved. Thank you. The board has just approved Edward Schneck, Associate Principal, Glen Lee Elementary School, Tabitha Taylor, Education Specialist in the Research Department of Assessment, Research, and Evaluation. For the next item, I am uh, pleased, as always, to have Dr. Teigen come forward and share an update from our health committee, as we have become accustomed to at each and every meeting. And so she's going to make her way and uh, provide us, again, an update of local health conditions, as well as any other matters that have been surfaced by the health committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Cooper, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. This afternoon, I will provide you with an update from our health committee meeting just this past Tuesday. Maybe. Today's ag agenda includes... Well, Let's try. Oh, 
please pardon our technical difficulties. And as she gets that presentation back up, I would just also, um, if you could come in a little closer to the mic when you're Absolutely. speaking. Absolutely. You. Today's agenda includes- little, Pull it down a little closer. Thank you. Includes the current transmission level for Henrico. Sorry, we're having to be cumbersome here. Um, plans for vaccination clinics. Additional information on contact tracing and um, some new quarantine recommendations, starting with the transmission level. If you can, I'll signal you one, thank you. <laughs> On Tuesday, the health committee reviewed health, um, the current health data for Henrico. Two weeks ago, I shared that the transmission level remained at the high level. As of this past Monday, we remain at the high level of transmission today. Based on the seven day data from August 29th to September 4th, the number of new cases per 100,000 in, um, in Henrico was 254.5. It was 214 two weeks ago. The percentage of PCR tests that were positive during the same time period was 8.8% up from the 7.3% two weeks ago. The health committee did not discuss the level of school impact as the school year had not started yet. That does not mean we haven't been working cases though. The Virginia Department of Education, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the Virginia Department of Health and the Richmond Henrico Health District are currently planning the vaccination events at both Fairfield and Elko Middle Schools to address the needs of our five to 11 year olds. Of course, these efforts are preliminary until the Pfizer vaccine is approved for this age group, but we're excited that work is underway. The same is true for the boosters, for those who receive the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. While there's been much conversation about boosters and how and when they might be administered, the rollout of the boosters is also still awaiting green light from the FDA and the CDC. As shared two weeks ago, we talked um, about what close contact meant. Um, a close contact means being within six feet of someone with COVID-19 for a total of 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour period. The VDH has clarified that there is an exception for K-12 settings. A student who was in three feet of an infected student is not considered a close contact, so that's three feet or more, as long as both the infected student and the exposed student wore well-fitted mask appropriately for the time they were together. This has been updated to apply to any K-12 setting to include outdoors. The exception does not apply to teachers, staff, or any other adults. And the exception does not apply to pre-K or any childcare providers. And lastly, it does not apply to school buses. That's something that's still under consideration, but at this point in time, school buses are still at six feet. Thus, HCPS will be using the recommended three-foot social distancing for K-12 students when contact tracing if both students were properly masked. We encourage parents to practice proper mask wearing outside of school to ensure that it happens within our school buildings. There has also been updated guidance related to quarantining. The general guidance for unvaccinated or partially vaccinated people identified as a close contact has not changed, but the Delta variant has impacted the pathway that we will be following. As the Delta variant spreads more quickly, we are able to reduce the quarantine period from 14 days to 10 days. So unvaccinated or partially vaccinated people could stay, would stay home, monitor their symptoms, and follow all recommendations, including wearing a mask, watching their distance, washing hands frequently for 10 days after their last exposure. 
The additional guidance is that if an unvaccinated individual gets a negative PCR or a rapid test performed on or after day five, the VDH states that they may return to school or to work on day eight. We will be transitioning to this approach in the next week. We plan to train additional staff to support the added volume of work, but we want impacted students and staff to be able to return to the classroom or work as soon as possible. The guidance for fully vaccinated people for COVID has not changed and they do not need to quarantine as long as they do not have symptoms. It is recommended that the fully vaccinated people should get tested three to five days after close contact exposure and wear a mask in public indoor settings for 14 days or until they receive a negative test result. The Health Committee continues to collaborate with both the Richmond Henrico Health District and the Virginia Department of Health to rev review the most current guidance as well as to collaborate on um, the workload related to contact tracing. And at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions for you. My partner, um, Ms. Gilbert, is not here today because she is busy processing some of our, um, our close contacts and our positive cases. Thank you so much, Dr. Tigan. Uh, Ms. Ms. Kinsella, I'm gonna start with you. Yes, well, thank you for, thank you for this update. Um, I, I guess I'll start with, you said, um, we'll start with the contact tracing. I'm certain Ms. Shea is gonna have more detailed questions, so I'll just stick to some about uh, <laughs> staffing. <clears throat> um, I've heard from a lot of folks, whether it's families or um, employees, about the time it's taking us to contact trace. And given what you just said, you know, um, it's not going to take as much time for quarantine, but the, the amount of time it's taking for contact tracing has caused quite a bit of frustration. So do we expect to, how do we expect to uh, get Ms. Gilbert some assistance with the contact tracing? Are we thinking uh, potentially using some um, employees that we currently employ, perhaps offering extra hours to them, similar to how our nurses help fill the void, fill the void um, in January, you know, uh, when we were given vaccines? Um, we have um, several strategies. One, we have allocated four part-time positions um, specifically for contact tracing. Um, two have been hired and are in the process of being onboarded. Um, two others are still uh, being sought. Um, there are candidates, so we should be shortly at the point of being able to do interviews. We've also temporarily reassigned um, two staff members to help. Um, with contact tracing and one of those um, individuals happens to be a nurse but it's not coming out of a school where it's needed you know where she's got the ability um, to be able to do this short term for us and so you know with that staff we know we're staffed greater than we were last year we know we have more students back in the building We've also um, are working to identify three other staff members to be able to help with this next phase of um, if they've tested having a different um, place and phone number to call to be able to um, report that they've been tested and to help work those cases. So we're really trying to divide and conquer so it's not all of the work falling in the same office either. Um, and so we'll continue to monitor based, based on needs. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, I guess next, sports. Sports have, sports have been an issue. Um, I, I think we've had our cases with athletics, um, not necessarily inside of our buildings during instructional time. If you could please explain one more time how we don't make the rules in terms of sports and sporting events that those are VHSL rules for the high school? 
Well, there, the high schools are ruled by the VHSL. Um, you know, we have, we do expect our athletes when they are not performing, that they're masking um, just like everyone else, that when they're actually on the field, they are. Um, I would say, um, and I can't be, it's not 100%, but many of the cases the where there has been transmission, I would um, say it hasn't happened actually on the, on the athletic field. Um, you know, carpooling together and not wearing masks in vehicles and being in close contact. There are other things that, um, that impact the close contacts and the spread. And so it, it's hard to, with the limited exposure this year, but we're seeing patterns that are about behaviors outside right. with mask wearing and social distancing that are also impacting athletics okay. at this point. Thank you. And then um, having spent some time in my schools last week, elementary, middle and high school, to see the mitigation plans and the safety plans that um, our principals put together, and then having spent some time in schools this week with students actually in the students and staff actually in the schools, um, we do expect plans to potentially uh, change, right? To be flexible, fluid, flexible, and subject to change in response to not having students in the building. And now that we have students in the building, we do expect to see some change. I think you, you ex uh, as a principal, you're monitoring all the time and especially at the beginning of any year. So in some ways, not any different than previous years. You know, you'll have staff meeting, you know, at least once, maybe twice, this is a short week with only being three days to get feedback from your staff about what's working, what's not, and coming together. And I also know um, Dr. Grant and her team are meeting with their principals to debrief and to, you know, assess what's happening in the buildings and, and if there are need for any changes or level of support you know, that's what they'll consider that and, and you know, work with their principals well, on what I, is needed. I'd like to uh, make a re request or recommend that when the principals do, when leadership does meet with principals, that we revisit, um, especially in our high schools. I would like to see the uh, plans revisited in terms of one way direction uh, perhaps staggered bells. I don't know how that impacts seat time, but I'd like for that to be considered having been in um, high school, um, it, it, Glen Allen High School to be exact, and also having received quite a bit of correspondence um, just about and uh, in, in realizing that the high schools, all nine are not using one way hallways. Are we, am I correct on that? Well, That's my understanding. That it, that's likely true is that principals have the ability within their building to look at, you know, combination between the number of students who are in the, in the school as well as the design of the school as to how they've laid that out. Okay. Um, that's one of the things I'm sure they'll, they'll look at and consider with their staff. Okay. Um, we know when they're in the hallways, you know, they're, they're wearing masks. That's an expectation at all times inside the building. Um, you know, that's one layer of mitigation we have. We know there's added mitigation strategies in classrooms and so on when we think about seating charts and um, possible plexiglass barriers and so on. So okay. there are different mitigation strategies. Well, I, that's, imp that's important, especially in our schools where we have more students. Again, um, Glen Ellen High School specifically, um, and after which you presented about the greater than three feet when possible, I'm not certain greater than three feet is always achievable in some of our buildings, depending on capacity. Um, so I appreciate the team looking into that with our, and working with our principals so that um, we can revise some of our safety plans. And then my next questions are for Mr. Pritchard and they concern transportation and filtration. Yes, ma'am. Yes, okay, so I appreciate all the questions you've answered um, from folks about filtration. If you could just give a brief update about filtration and the air scrubbers 
that we put in all that we're putting in all of our schools, right? That that we purchased. If you could just give a brief update about that, I'd appreciate it. Sure. And, and previously, they were put in our clinics and our isolations rooms. Um, when we did a study back in last spring and fall, when we were upgrading our filters, some of our systems are not able to to adapt to re changing our filters and upgrading. So we were able to place filtration systems or air scrubbers in classrooms that were that was impossible. So we were able to do that. Um, I know that we've made our deliveries around to the elementary schools to place air filters and air scrubbers or air scrubbers into the cafeterias. And they were being delivered um, as they were purchased and being delivered to the secondary schools this week. Okay. Yes. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the next subject is transportation. And, and I realize we are still short drivers and we're doing the best that we can and that we'll, it will get better with each day. Um, do we have access to a bus app? We are in the process of putting the bus app or ha having the bus app installed to our buses, all 600 of them. That's a timely process. Like everything else, the, the delivery date on getting the, those devices here were compounded with COVID and everything else, but we are in the process of getting them installed on our buses as we speak. Okay. Yes. So, so after they're installed and folks are trained, do we expect to share that? Yes, we do. With, and have that available for parents, yes. right? Yes, ma'am. And then in the interim, um, principals don't know which buses are going to be late, do they? Not necessarily, right? Like the notifications are made from um, transportation? Yes. And that's through Messenger, correct? Yes. I'd like to request that principals get, um, have some knowledge of that, um, just so that they can um, better respond to parents, if you will. Yes, ma'am. And then I'd also like to make one more recommendation that when leadership meets with our principals, that they revisit some of the uh, traffic patterns. I know those are impeding our buses as well. Are they not, Mr. Pritchard? Yes, they can be at times, yes. I mean, first day was the first day, but the thing, I know when I made my rounds around this morning, there was a drastic improvement in that area. Um, and it will continually get better as the days kind of settle down. But yes, I mean, I think that always going back and taking a look at your traffic flow would help. Primarily at our elementary schools, that's, that's where probably most of our congestion occurs because of the size of the footprint of the school and the layout and the way that they were done back in the day when most of the kids rode bus to school or they walked to school, so. Okay, I would also, I'd just like to see it across elementary, middle and high. Yes. And uh, with attention, especially with our juniors and seniors driving, mm -hmm. um, considering their safety and just all the students that, that I've seen and doing transportation with my own children. Um, I just like to make sure that happens. And then that's all I have. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Consala Miche. Yeah, Mr. Perkins, you just wait right there. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so um, the two biggest pieces of feedback I've gotten this week have been about quarantine, which I'll go into with uh, Dr. Tigett and transportation. And so um, I think Ms. Kinsella covered a lot of the points. Um, just two more about transportation. Um, can you just share with our public what you shared with me about School Messenger? So we use School Messenger to notify of late buses. Um, there was some uh, frustration that it wasn't used yesterday for late buses, and yes. the reason is? We had a, we, we, our School Messenger was not working properly the first thing yesterday morning, of course it was not. So it was first day of school and that went down, and so we had issues, and it wasn't until mid-morning when, when it was able to be reestablished and used. Thank so you. by that time, it was, stuff was already going through. But the intention is when we have late buses to yes. be sending, and that's sent out, like Ms. Uh, Kinsella said, through the Transportation Department. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, and then I just wanted to add, and I know probably a number of board members have questions related to transportation and, and happy to take some of those here. And I know some of you have reached out to me directly uh, yesterday. And as we work through a number of issues, including the installation of the app, uh, we will absolutely be prepared, Lenny and his team, to provide a transportation update, a summary of where we've been from the first day of school to the next board meeting that uh, will cover any of number of items related to timelines for the app and, and some more specific details. I know that is a, uh, an interest. Uh, a high topic, a high interest topic rather for our families as well as for board members and uh, we'll be prepared to provide a thorough update. 
Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Um, and then one more piece about transportation. Um, I know we're looking at uh, um, our routes and our uh, bus usage this week. Um, could we expect any time in the coming weeks an update of uh, uh, some of the routes to update to improve efficiencies? Yes. Yes, ma'am. We can we can look at that and then we'll provide an update when we present to the board um, and later in September. Yes. Thank you. Yes. And I know transportation has been a work in progress for a, a lot of reasons. You know, some people say we've had all summer to plan. Well, we have been planning, not just for the summer, but the last 18 months. But as students have changed from brick and mortar to uh, virtual and maybe back to brick and mortar, it changes capacity and bus routes. Um, also students who are just changing their transportation modes, changes bus routes. Also as we onboard more drivers, which is an amazing thing and that we wanna keep doing, it also changes bus routes. So um, it's a fluid and flexible thing and I appreciate all your team is doing to um, maximize the efficiency. Thank you. Thank you. That's all for transportation. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, Dr. Tigan, thank you for this update. And I appreciate, I think this is a great, today is a great illustration of us going back at, at least every two weeks and revisiting our mitigation strategies to include uh, best practices and recommendations. And so we see that today with implementing this exception from the VDH as well as uh, the, the quarantine times. And so I think um, it's not just masking. Some people think we thought we were just gonna talk about masks every two weeks. It's not just talking about masks. Uh, it's, talk, it's looking comprehensively at all of our mitigation in our buildings, what's working, what could have improvements, um, what new recommendations have, have we gotten? So um, I think this is tremendous. I think the goal for all of us is to keep our students in the building safely learning. And so um, by clarifying um, some of the shortening this quarantine time, as well as clarifying close contacts, that's gonna keep a lot more students in our building. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, Ms. Kinsella asked about contact tracing um, and you shared that. Is there any building, is there like a, a building point person for each building for contact tracing? There, there ha the nurse has served in some capacity as that contact tracing um, person, um, but it's also going through the building principal as far as you know information about um, positive cases, quarantine times, and communicating when someone um, is able to come back into the building. So it is two, you know two people right now that are for different reasons. Nurses are helping, they have helped make some phone calls um, and reaching out to families and updating um, well agent files because we have to keep track. All of these are medical records of our students and so we have to keep a record of them in our um, electronic record, medical record system. Thank you. And I know there's been some frustration from families who um, were put in quarantine before school started as to um, communication on being cleared, uh, but quarantines from before school started from the community, that's separate. Is that se that's separate from our contact tracing team? It is, and there's some crossover. And so um, things will come into the health department and then they'll, we meet with them several times a week. Uh, but cases will come over. Sometimes we have cases that they don't have. And so it's trying to make sure that everyone's aware, but it has, you know, we met earlier this week because that process hasn't been as seamless as it needs to be for both teams to operate well. And so we're working at um, how, how we approach that process and hoping that we can improve it. Um, you know, right now with the transmission level, the number of cases is really high. And so things are coming in from the community. They're, they've been back, you know, they're there and been coming in from the community. And, you know, that has things tied up as well. But we are working diligently to reduce that backlog and be able to, as you said, our goal is to keep students in the classroom learning and keep teachers and other staff in either the classroom, the buildings, so that we, you know, we're continuing with instruction there. It's two layers that are both are critical to us as we continue in this school year. Thank you. Um, how are um, 
how is a student or a staff member who's uh, been informed they need to isolate or, or quarantine, how are they released from that? Do they, um, are they given a date and they release or do they have to wait for a specific communication? There, um, it varies on what information is available when that first contact is made. And like I said, we transfer files across between the health department and schools. And so, you know, it, sometimes you don't have all of the pieces of information. And so you're trying to gather that first. And sometimes there's a change. Um, and it, I know it's been frustrating to our families because I think they have a return date. Um, I'll give you one example of something that can happen that changes it, is that um, my child was quarantined with a positive, say a positive case. So they were, you know, actually, um, they were the ones with COVID. That then I can have a return date for that child. Of course, it depends that the child has to be asymptomatic on that date. And then if someone else in the household gets COVID, then they go back into the quarantine because now they're in close proximity. And so, um, or if a parent ends up positive from the child, and so that can end up extending. And that I know um, has frustrated some of our families as well. And so it's, it's not a one size fits all, um, you know, and so it's trying to help families understand, but, I know it can be very frustrating because they don't live in this world and they don't want to live in this world. And sometimes we don't want to live in this world either, but it's, you know, it's where we are and what we're trying to do to, to keep everybody safe. Yeah, I think, um, I, I, I think that's so important to understand, you know, the pieces um, and also as much as we can uh, equipping families with the information they need to solve those pieces so that they're not necessarily waiting on someone who's already stretched too thin to be able to um, follow up. Right. Um, and then related to that, um, for vaccinated staff and students, um, if they're notified that they're a close contact, is there anything that they're waiting, and they are asymptomatic, is there anything that they are waiting on to be able to return to the building? We're trying to get those turned around as soon as we know that they are fully vaccinated. Um, we can't, they, we can't mandate that they share that with us, but we know, you know, we hope that they will, and I think most of them want to be able to share their vaccination status if it means they can get back in the building and, and to work, or, or even for our students. You know, um, our, some, uh, many of our students are vaccinated at the middle and high school level, and so getting them back in, it's, it's not just our staff. It's yeah, so I, as well. yeah, I think anything we can do and think outside the box on how to shorten that turnaround so we can get back to that goal that we stated earlier of keeping our students safely in the building learning. Um, and then the, just the last thing, um, looking at the dashboard um, on our web page that we use to track cases. Um, it has the school, the number of positives, number of contacts, outbreaks, date last listed. Um, I don't know how easy it is to update, so I don't want to reinvent the wheel, but it would be really helpful if it had kind of two extra columns uh, so that it was like the number of positive cases this week, the number of contacts from positive cases this week, and then what we have existing is kind of totals. I think um, for me, it helps when I'm looking at the schools in my district to see who might need more support or just understanding what happens. Sometimes it's hard to keep that total number in my head to compare to yesterday. But if I at least had a breakdown of what's happening this week, I think it helps to visualize what's happening across the county. Thank you. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Shea. Ms. Ogburn? Thank you. Um, I wanted to echo uh, the last point that Ms. Shea um, mentioned. I've heard that from another, a number of constituents as well, that more information is, is better, and so they've asked for similar kinds of data, and I think that would help. Um, so if we can, you know, do something like that. Um, but just real quick, um, I know that you're probably pretty tired, and I, I, I'm pre just wanted to let you know how much we all appreciate the work that you've done over the last few weeks, especially on communicating with parents, getting that information out there that they need 
um, and making sure that everybody has the answers as best as we can give them. So I, I wanted to say that. But secondly, um, I know that there are parents who still have questions. They still have um, things that they don't feel like have been covered or they don't know where to look. So I thought I would just ask you real quickly, what's the best resource for parents if they're trying to find answers, we'll get it on the record, where should they go specifically to our website, et cetera? Um, what are their options for getting their answers to their questions that they might have? And I'm getting some about the flow chart and that kind of thing. Um, so if you could just summarize it, where, where they, all those answers are, I think. There, that there are two places on the website that they could go for information. One is when they look at the health um, button and can push on that, and there's a plethora of information there. And then also on the back to school site where there's information you know, that could be more pertaining to learning like the document you just showed. Um, it's tied to learning during quarantine and those processes. And so there's lots of information there. There's some FAQs there as well. Um, and if there's something that they don't see and have a suggestion, um, they can certainly send me an email and say, here's something I'd like to see more information or a question. Can you get answered and put on the website? And we'll, we'll work towards that. Okay, thank you so much. That's it for me. Thank, thank you. you so much, Ms. Abra. Mrs. Um, Atkins. Thank you, Dr. Tigan. I don't have a lot, but I just more so a statement than a question because I want families to be aware of uh, some of the things that we are doing. Definitely want to make sure in addition to continuing to improve on the mitigation strategies that we have. Uh, one of the other areas of improvement around athletics, particularly now with COVID, is the way in which we handle our ticket sales for our athletic programs, which is a manual one. And something that I have uh, talked to Dr. Tigan as well as Dr. Cashwell about is about evolving to an electronic ticket process. And so I do wanna share that with families, particularly those that are buying tickets for games and so forth and so on. It makes sense, even if COVID wasn't here, to, to continue to evolve and move towards an electronic ticket process. So know that, that we are definitely um, exploring that and doing the best we can to move as swiftly as possible. So Dr. Tigan, not expecting a comment unless you have one, but I just want families to know that I'm continuing to look for different ways that we can improve that are out of the box. And I certainly believe moving forward with an electronic ticket process is helpful in this space. So I uh, wanted to share that with families. And then Mr. Pritchard, if you would come up because I have a question around transportation. And while he's coming, I will share that the health committee on Tuesday did discuss the e-ticketing. Um, and felt like it was something we needed to move towards and we're in the process. And if we have more information, we'll be gladly, glad to share. Fantastic, thank you. Um, one of the areas, uh, as schools begin to settle, the first day of school always is about working through kinks. And there are some things you are just not going to know until you have actually maybe the first week of school to better understand. And then I know principals will sit down to try to explore to make changes uh, that best suits that particular school, because every single school is different. Particularly with Highland Springs High School, once things settle, one of the ideas is to look at a alternative bus route because I know that there are families that have chosen to take their children to school and that increases the line at the beginning and end of school. So over at uh, the New Holland Springs High School, perhaps looking at just exploring some alternative ways for the buses to get in and out of school. So as you're continuing all that you do, just wanted to share that with you, you as well. Thank you. My pleasure, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Atkins. Um, read Director Ms. Shea real quick. Thank you, Chair. Um, Dr. Tigan, one more for you. Um, I know we talked a little bit about testing programs at Glen Lee last time. Has there any been any further consideration of perhaps participating in a program like the, what is it called, the VISTA? 
uh, through there, the Virginia Health Department. There has, um, the Health Committee also discussed that there wasn't any, we decided we needed additional information. It's been difficult to get information from especially large school divisions that have implemented. Um, they have signed up, but they haven't been able to implement what at this point, given everything else. And so we're in that gathering data stage because there's, there's a lot of tentacles to it that aren't obvious at the beginning. Um, you know, once we have medical data on students, there's an obligation, even staff, there's an obligation to keep that and the retention and how do we do that. So those things are being discussed, absolutely. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Dr. Sagan, I just have one question, and my question just pertains to our student athletes and outdoor athletic events. Um, I know Mrs. Gonzalez briefly broached that subject, um, but for me, with community transmission uh, level still high, uh, my concern is about the health and safety of our student athletes, staff, and game attendees. Um, some school systems have mandated vaccines for their student athletes, for many of our collegiate and professional uh, sports teams. They have what's called fan health and safety guidelines um, that require game attendees to show proof of vaccination or negative COVID test for entry. Um, some require face coverings and other mitigation strategies that extend to the outdoor setting. Um, when we take into account all the vaccination efforts that we've done jointly as the county, along with layered mitigation strategies, we're imploring to keep our students and staff safe in the buildings, the buses. Uh, what recommendation, recommendations, if any, uh, is the health committee exploring now to keep our student athletes and game attendees safe in the context of, I know Fairfax County specifically um, is as well guided by VHSL, but they took the step to mandate uh, vaccines for their student athletes. Could you speak to uh, what may be hindering us or are we exploring that avenue as well? We, we really have not as a health committee talked about mandating vaccines. Um, there's, you know, there are reasons why some individuals cannot receive a vaccine. There's personal reasons why they might not want to, um, you know, and we have really focused on the mitigation efforts and we still highly recommend our fans that come to games to wear masks. Our athletes are expected to wear masks when they're not actually in play. And, you know, those are, we encourage social distancing. Um, you know, so while we share with everyone what those mitigation expectations are, what, what we would like to see, um, you know, one of those being mandated vaccines, we've not done. I mean, it's, it's something that is out there that we can talk about, but I, I think it comes with other, other things as well. And we're living in a time where, um, you know, I, I think specifically about ta about um, staff. You know, and you think about our athletic coaches and so on. Um, we we're struggling right now. I mean, you you've talked about bus drivers um, in our situation, um, teachers. You know, it's really difficult right now to find sufficient qualified staff to help with keeping our schools open and operating. And so to, to add another barrier to, you know, that is very personal to some people, it's just not something we've, you know, decided to do at this point. So I would love to, I guess this would be an ongoing conversation. I guess it's, it's ebbing and flowing in regards to shifting. Um, I do understand and appreciate and respect the challenges that we are having um, staffing wise. So, I mean, this is definitely something we'll continue to talk about. I appreciate that answer. Absolutely. Madam Superintendent. All right, that concludes our health committee um, report. We'll look forward to bringing back, uh, uh, of course, continual updates as our health committee continues to work through any number of issues that you all have surfaced and many more that we didn't tackle today. Um, and then also uh, to some of the transportation specific questions that uh, went to Mr. Pritchard, we will uh, be sure to prepare a specific update transportation item uh, to get at any number of, again, issues that have been raised here today. And again, we continue to work through those.
All right, for the next item, uh, we have an update on our strategic plan destination 20 to 2025. And as you know, uh, we've promised the board and our public periodic updates. We have a large strategic plan, a lot of goals there that we are um, not losing sight of and we continue to work towards achieving. And so uh, while this update does not, rec uh, does not cover progress on the entire plan, it does cover a few goals. And so uh, we look forward to being able to share some updates on our progress here, and I'll turn it, turn it over to Dr. Hinton, and I know she's joined by some other presenters. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. This afternoon, we'd like to provide you with an update on the Division Strategic Plan, Destination 2025. The strategic plan includes six strategic goals grounded in the Division's four cornerstones. Additionally, equity is the lens through which we view all components of the plan, and we have four areas of equity focus. Each strategic goal is supported through implementation drivers, which are the focused action steps taken to achieve our longer term goals. Implementation drivers have been outlined in the plan with target completion dates through 2025. The implementation of the drivers is achieved through a targeted professional development plan. The roadmap provides the three professional learning focus areas for leaders. Professional learning is provided both by Henrico leaders and by experts in the field, in venues such as principal meetings, quarterly meetings, and designated professional learning days. At this time, we'd like to provide you with updates related to four of the implementation drivers with target completion dates of 2021. First, Ms. Bostain and Mr. Maddox will provide an update on the Instructional Technology Plan, followed by Mr. Dussault and Ms. Seeley to share the division's progress in developing a teaching and learning framework and curriculum alignment. And Dr. Baker and Ms. Stewart will then share information on how the division is working to grow and support teacher leaders. Good afternoon. Our presentation today will provide an update on how innovation and the purposeful use of technology supports learning, teaching, leading, and infrastructure. The first area we will provide an update on is learning, where highlights include our curriculum that was transformed over the last two years to a fully digital platform, allowing equitable access to a wide variety of resources for learning. This includes digital tools that are available through our HCPS Clever Portal that provide all stakeholders with the opportunity to access real-time performance data that empowers learner agency and the integration of the Virginia Department of Education's Computer Science and Digital Learning Integration Standards. These standards include the safe and ethical use of technology where our efforts in Henrico were recognized by Common Sense Education a national nonprofit organization for our continued commitment to providing safe and innovative learning spaces for our students to thrive as they harness the power of technology for learning and life. Our next category is teaching, where we focused on developing and employing innovative strategies and practices through HCPSU, our online professional learning platform that was recognized by the National Association of Counties, or NACO, and providing every school with an innovative learning coach, or ILC, to provide job embedded professional learning, as well as instructional technology support for students, staff, and families to ensure they have what they need for success. And finally, leading, where highlights include support for the U.S. Department of Education's Go Open initiative, designed to increase equity, empower teachers, and keep content relevant and high quality through our state-level participation with the Virginia Department of Education, where Henrico Schools is proud to help lead the way with the state's Go Open Virginia initiative a growing community working together to help personalize learning and address the learning goals of the profile of a Virginia graduate. 
Our innovative learning leadership practices have also been recognized by the State Board through our selection and participation in the Virginia is for Learners Innovation Network for the second year in a row. This is an innovative statewide professional learning network that is also aligned to the critical competencies of the profile of a Virginia graduate, and we are honored to be one of the selected districts to help lead the way. And finally, our last highlight as it relates to leading is our recognition by the State Board of Education as a school division of innovation for designing and implementing practices and structures that improve student learning and promote college and career readiness and good citizenship. We are proud to share that we, along with 14 other Virginia school divisions, were the first out of 132 school divisions across the state to earn this designation. Our work with this designation will continue over the course of this school year, where we will focus on learner agency, portfolios, and performance assessments. And we know that none of this would be possible without the infrastructure and design of safe learning spaces for our students. At this time, Brian Maddox, our Director of Technology, will provide an update on our infrastructure for digital learning. Good afternoon. Uh, so to best support and empower learning for all of our students, we must provide the best technologies. The most fundamental technology component for learning is the device in the hands of students, teachers, and staff. This includes iPads, Chromebooks, and laptops in the division. And since March of 2020, every student from pre-K all the way to grade 12 has a dedicated HCPS device to learn with. Next is technology in the classroom, such as panels. Uh, another exciting project underway in recent months is the purchase of over 1,400 Promethean panels for classrooms at all grade levels and in every school or program site. This is the first significant effort in many years to address deficiencies in display technologies in about 35% of our classrooms this year. This first phase of the project is planned to run through the beginning of 2022 with ongoing efforts continuing for the years to come. And of course, for the devices and the panels and all the other technologies to work, we need a really strong, stable, secure network. And of course, HCPS continues to invest millions of dollars every six to seven years to refresh all school-based network cabling and infrastructure. A robust network involves continuous performance monitoring and bandwidth adjustments to meet learning needs as they change and evolve. Also, the school division is committed to continue to provide internet access solutions for families in need to bridge the digital divide for any time, anywhere learning. And of course, behind every application or system that we have used for learning or division operations, there's the related data center hardware uh, that must be properly configured, tuned, and managed. The data center is typically refreshed every seven years and is next scheduled for a refresh around 2025. The last data refresh of the HCPS data center was in 2018. Technology continues to explore cloud offerings versus hosting in the data center to provide solutions that are optimized, flexible, secure, and the most cost-effective. <clears throat> And of course, very important is maintaining a secure learning environment with minimal interruptions to student learning or division operations. And this is a fine line to walk and is a critical focus of the technology department. Some division examples of these efforts are always on content web filtering to ensure a safe learning experience, email security solutions to block malware and attempts to infiltrate HCPS accounts and systems, and also third party engagements with cybersecurity experts to probe technology infrastructure and systems to make sure they're secure. And for example, last year in August and September, the FBI reported that K-12 school divisions accounted for almost 60% of all reported ransomware events. And given this technology continues to work diligently to harden the HCPS technical landscape and to secure the HCPS data center for learning anywhere, anytime. And of course, last but not least, uh, we have the investments in technology by the division. There will always be a need to provide in-person help when something doesn't work as it should. The technology department is continually focused to be customer-centric and dedicated to the student and employee learning experience uh, using the best practices and processes. And now I'd like to hand it over to Mr. Michael DeSalt, Director of Teaching Learning Innovation, to share an update on the instructional model.
In order for students to be successful, Henrico must have a common vision for teaching and learning. This commitment must include an aligned curriculum, instructional model, and ongoing professional learning. The division learning continuously aligns curriculum each calendar year, and it is a repeating process. Ongoing professional learning informs and supports staff on instructional best practices. This past year, we developed the final piece of the puzzle, the instructional model. Each of the documents and models you see here have been important pieces to help shape and define our instructional puzzle to ensure Henrico's best practices evolved over time to meet the needs of the students and our staff. And while we know all these components and models are critical, our Destination 2025 focus has been to funnel them into a singular instructional model. This past year, collaboration between the Division of School Leadership and the Division of Learning intentionally pulled these best practices together into an instructional model that succinctly identified our core beliefs. Here you see the final result. Henrico's instructional model to drive our progress towards destination 2025. While the instructional model only makes up one portion of the teaching and learning framework, it truly is the anchor for supporting our instructional staff. While we know our ultimate goal is for students to be life ready when they leave our classrooms, we selected a graduation cap to remind us of our important target. The base of the cap serves as the foundational support needed to ensure every HCPS student will be successful. Henrico understands a learner-centered community that meets the social, emotional, and cultural needs of our students is a key to our model. Design, deliver, and assess practices are put together in the form of puzzle pieces to allow for varying starting points within the model. This gives our teachers the opportunity to reflect and respond as they move through the various components of the model to meet the individual needs of our students. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Ms. Anne Marie Seely, Director of School Quality, who will discuss our finalized instructional best practices. Now that the instructional model has a structure with defined elements, we are turning our attention to articulating the research-based best, research -based best practices necessary to implement the elements. Here you see the final structure of our collef collective efforts to align best practices pulled from various HCPS documents. In June 2021, we sought feedback from all instructional staff around the best practices that should be emphasized within the instructional model. At the August quarterly meeting, administrators provided insight and feedback on the implementation plan and timeline. As we head into the 21-22 school year, the Division of Learning will build the resources, documents, and examples associated with these elements. The instructional model infrastructure will continue to be developed through the input of our teachers and administrators. Their input in conjunction with the Division of Learning will ultimately provide clarity in defining the best practices of design, deliver, and assess within the learner-centered community for the HCPS classroom. At this time, I will turn the presentation over to Drew Baker and Angela Stewart in Professional Learning and Leadership, who will discuss recruiting and retaining a diverse workforce. Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Drew Baker on behalf of the Department of Professional Learning and Leadership and Human Resources, we will be giving an overview of some of the dynamic programs in which we engage to help retain and recruit the highest quality educators available. The first way that we support teacher career advancements is through the National Board Certification Program. Our national board class this past year in 2021 was the sixth largest in the nation and the first largest in Virginia. We're excited because we had four times more teachers of color in the cohort uh, from 2017 to 2021. And 92% of HCPS national board teachers agree that, quote, I am more likely to remain in the teaching profession now that I have completed national board certification. 
Our cohorts are teacher-led, which means each one is led by a trained HCPS teacher facilitator. They have monthly meetings to support national board candidates. This provides new teacher leadership opportunities for people who want to be these facilitators. And our pass rate this past year was 91% compared to the national rate, which hovers right around 60%. Another way we innovate in retaining high quality professionals is through the Aspiring Leader Academy. The Aspiring Leader Academy, also known as ALA, is a year-long professional learning series that provides authentic leadership experiences facilitated by Henrico leaders and is aligned to the professional standards for educational leaders and the teacher leader model standards. The purpose of ALA is to ensure leadership capacity by recruiting, hiring, developing, empowering, and retaining teacher leaders and our next school Leaders. Each cohort has approximately 25 members who participate in one of two available tracks. Teacher leader track for teachers who wish to have leadership experience while remaining in the classroom and an administration track for teachers who wish to become school administrators. We also partner with local universities to help both retain and recruit the best teachers possible. HCPS partners with colleges and universities in multiple ways to enhance recruitment and retention. A few examples are we work with the VCU Minority Educator Recruitment, Retention and Equity Center. We have mentoring efforts for students of local colleges and universities, particularly in historically black college, colleges and universities to include mock interviews, round tables, and other things to build their skills. And then we have implementation of various grant opportunities to facilitate attainment of licensure and professional development. And now I will pass off the microphone to my colleague, Ms. Angela Stewart. Thank you. To support new teachers and retain experienced teachers, we maintain a dynamic teacher mentoring program. The teacher mentoring program is designed to provide support to beginning teachers, starting with induction and continuing support throughout their professional teaching years in Henrico County Public Schools. The teacher mentoring program is comprised of the assignment of a mentor for beginning teachers, weekly, monthly, and whole division workshops, mid-year new teacher conference, and support at the classroom, school, and division level. Our instructional coaching program seeks to support those teachers already in the classroom and support them in meeting the needs of students they serve. HCPS takes a strengths-based approach to instructional coaching that is job embedded, non-evaluative, and student-centered. The coaching program includes a unified coaching model, instructional coach performance standards, and ongoing professional support for all coaches. Finally, building on our university partnerships, we also help lead the way with residency programs to reimagine how new teachers enter the profession ready to make an impact with students. Through the Richmond Residency Program in partnership with Virginia Commonwealth University and the School-Based Teacher Education Program, also known as STEP, in collaboration with the University of Richmond. The Teacher Residency Program recruits, trains, and places high quality educators in divisions across the region through the Virginia Commonwealth University Partnership. It is particularly focused on developing teachers for high needs, urban and hard to staff classrooms, and includes a full master's coursework plus a year long residency. The STEP program is an exclusive partnership between Henrico and the University of Richmond with a focus on staffing and training for schools with high teacher turnover rates. This program also includes a full year of paid residency. Both programs show a 100% job placement rate for educators in Henrico schools. And now I'd like to pass the microphone to Dr. Tinton to talk about our performance metrics. So as you can see, work is well underway to ensure our students are educated by a high quality workforce and have life ready experiences leading to college or career readiness. As we implement the plan drivers, we monitor our progress through key performance metrics. We are excited to share that we have recently obtained iDashboards, a data visualization platform that will allow us to communicate our results in a user friendly way to our community. The data dashboard will include aggregate division level data for each of our metrics and will be dynamically displayed through interactive charts and graphs embedded within the destination 2025 page of our website. 
In our recent survey, 77% of families reported an awareness of our strategic plan. And through this new tool, we hope to increase awareness and engagement with our community. In our December update, we'll be able to share the dashboard with the available data at that time. Destination 2025 guides the division's improvement efforts. This has been evident through the bi-monthly work session presentations, which connect each presentation topic to one of our six goals. This timeline shows when data for each metric will be shared and aligns with the presentation updates typically given during each month. After presenting the data to the board, the new data dashboard will be updated with the most current information for the public. We will continue to provide specific strategic plan updates three times per year to include progress updates on the implementation drivers and metrics. Due to the limited data from the last school year, we will convene the Strategic Plan Steering Committee in February to review our progress and collect input on updates needed. For this month, Ms. Berry will be providing data related to school safety, which aligns with our strategic goals of fostering an inclusive, safe and supportive climate and providing equitable and secure physical learning environments. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board and Dr. Cashwell. Today I will share an update regarding our safety metrics to include the percentage of schools that exceeded expectations on their most recent comprehensive safety audit this past school year and give you an introduction to our threat assessment model and how we plan to measure growth in the upcoming school year. The schools that received their comprehensive audit this past year were initially scheduled for the 2019-2020 school year. But due to COVID, we had to push those remaining nine schools to the 2020-2021 school year. I am happy to report that of all nine schools audited last year, they all received the highest possible rating of exceeds expectation. This is the third year in a row during the comprehensive safety audit process that all audited schools received this rating. Of the nine schools receiving an overall exceeds expectations, four of those schools exceeded expectations in all areas in which they were audited. These schools went through a completely different way of auditing, but they adapted and were able to highlight all areas of focus effortlessly. Regardless of how we were educating students, they ensured safety was a top priority and truly cultivated a climate of safety. In the fall of 2019, we initiated the utilization of the HCPS threat assessment model. We worked with multiple different stakeholders to ensure we had developed a collaborative process for targeted violence intervention, specifically for our schools. Our vision was to support the HCPS cornerstone of safety and wellness to develop, maintain, and utilize a meaningful threat assessment process to identify and intercept targeted violence while promoting a climate of safe and healthy schools through prevention, intervention, and support. The HCPS threat assessment process includes three levels of threat assessment teams, known as TATs. The school-based TAT is the threat assessment team for each HCPS campus and learning center. There is also a divisional TAT, which provides oversight to the school-based teams. And each member is a resource for all threat assessment members regarding any areas of concern. The third level is the threat assessment team for the County of Henrico. The county's community threat assessment team provides the same intervention services to individuals and the community that the TAD is providing in the schools. After month of, months of training with staff, we hit the ground running in September 2019, but then came COVID, which forced us to pause and recalculate how this process was going to work now that students were not in the building. We developed guidance for school TATs to refer to for maintaining cases and work closely with our community partners for support and assistance with providing intervention resources and services. With students returning to the buildings for the 2021-2022 school year, we consider this to be our baseline year. Going into this school year with our new gain perspective, we feel confident we will be able to collect data that is an accurate representation of our model. We want to be able to show the growth individuals have made through an intervention-driven process, and I look forward to sharing this data with you in the coming school year. I will now turn it back over to Tiffany. Thank you, um, and that concludes all of our updates. We are happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you so much, Dr. Hinton. I'm going to start with Mrs. Atkins. Thank you everyone for that update. I do have a few questions. 
Um, the first one uh, is just more a learning opportunity for me. If you could share more details or information around the internet access solutions that was shared. Yes, ma'am. So I'm curious as to, in the update, could you share a little bit more on what those updates are, particularly around the internet solutions? So we're uh, continuing to provide hotspots to families that currently have them. And the plan for this year is there's also um, the offering of Comcast Internet Essentials, which is for families in need. So we're promoting that with families as well. Uh, in addition, we're sharing with families, there's a federal program called the Emergency Broadband Benefit, or the EBB, which provides $50 a month for families for internet access at home uh, for remote learning. So we're sharing that with families too, so they can apply for that if they need it. So those are the offerings currently today. Thank you. Uh, some ideas that was shared with me, I know um, a representative of Google are exploring using Google Blimps to go across different school divisions. It's a pilot um, and that they're using to be able to use that resource in this pilot effort for several different school systems. And I'll send you more information about that. So particularly, of course, in Verina, Sanston, and Holland Springs, where we have those pockets that you just can't get the consistent access in. Uh, so just wanted to share that with you. Also um, wanted to know if there was conversations around um, acquiring a bus or using an old bus to push out internet services, so almost like a mobile internet bus. Is that something that has been discussed? We have discussed that. Uh, currently, mm -hmm. we aren't pursuing something like that, uh, but we have discussed it in the past, and we'll continue to look at options like that as it makes sense. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, and also, again, this is another learning opportunity for me, and I'll also share some ideas that, that I've received and share if it's appropriate. Uh, are around the data center solutions. Do you mind sharing more information on exactly what solutions are involved here? Of course, so we currently have our on-prem data center, which is a, a partnership with Henrico County. Mm -hmm. So they renovated their data center back in 2017 and we joined them in 2018. Uh, so we continue to have the majority of our offerings out of that primary physical data center, but we're also looking at cloud offerings. So we currently have, of course, uh, Google Workspace uh, for staff and students, which is in the cloud. Uh, our Microsoft email and other offerings is in the cloud. That's Office 365. Uh, we also have um, taken advantage of Microsoft uh, Azure, uh, which is what it's called, which is hosting um, of different types of solutions. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to a lot of the other, they call it software as a service offerings, uh, which is uh, Talonet, for example, is one of those cloud offerings. Uh, Safe Schools is another one. So we continue to explore those offerings for applications as they make sense. And then for the data center with the next refresh in 2025, uh, we continue to explore uh, cloud hosting solutions to where as opposed to investing um, in infrastructure in a physical data center um, at the administration location off of Parham Road with the county, uh, we're exploring uh, hosting infrastructure in the cloud uh, using Microsoft Azure or Amazon Web Services. So we continue to explore those offerings as they make sense and if they're cost effective for the long term. Thank you for that. I'm just taking notes as you're speaking so that I can capture sure. it. Thank you for that. Those are, are great, great responses to that question. I'm really delighted to hear that those conversations are happening and that we're trying to continue to evolve in innovation, because that's exactly what you're talking about here. So I'm very delighted to hear that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then I also had a question around, you know, one of our, our cornerstones is relationships. And as you flow through the presentation, I was trying to tie in how do we also tie in in our strategic plan and looking for some solutions or answers around family engagement. I'm not sure who the appropriate person would be to answer that, but um, wondering how relationship building is built into your update. 
I think I can speak to some of this. I see, uh, yeah, you please continue to come forward. I'll just start to answer. We really just pulled out some of our goals for this um, presentation specifically around academic excellence and recruiting and retaining and certainly relationships is a cornerstone built in throughout, but um, some future updates will feature some of those specific areas where we're working to build relationships because you're absolutely right. That's key to our strategic plan work. But um, Mrs. Cole Johnson, I'll turn it over to you to add any insights there. Absolutely. Just to add, I know that we're scheduled to be here for the, I think the December um, school board meeting. So we'll be providing some, some specific updates. I know Mac and I will be um, here with Dr. Hinton to do that um, later on in the year. Thank you for providing that update because I, I wasn't aware that we were only touching on a few. And so, you know, family engagement and community engagement has to be weaved in every single part. And so I'm pleased to hear that we will be receiving an update on that. So thank you so much. And that concludes my questions and thoughts. Thank you so much, Mrs. Atkins. Ms. Ogren. Thank you. Um, first of all, wealth of information, and, and I really do appreciate it. Um, I, I think any time we have a survey that shows 77% of our families are aware of the strategic plan, what we're doing with it, and have engaged with the strategic plan, we're doing something right. Because, you know, for, I'm not the youngest person in the room, so I can tell you, usually strategic plans sit on a shelf and collect dust. And the fact that this is a living, breathing thing that we're using it to guide the work, I think is great. And that our constituents know about it and, and are involved in it, I think is just, is great progress. Um, but it's, to me, this represents, it's a summary of the really great intense work that's going on. I think that uh, we're really hitting the mark on getting this work done and it's purposeful and it has meaning. Um, but it also shows me well-planned, robust learning experiences and that's what it's all about. Um, I was also really glad to see a focus on uh, teacher retention and and recruiting the, a diverse staff. We have a diverse county. We need to have a diverse staff. I know we're doing what we can, but having that as part of our strategic plan, I think is great. But Mr. DeSalvo, I'm gonna put you on the spot for just a second. The teacher in me cannot help but look at the instructional model. And I, I just if you could explain just a little bit of how we're taking our instructional model from the deeper learning graph that we're all used to seeing now. And I take, has this morphed into um, a new format or are we still using the deeper learning model graph and how those two fit together? That's a great question. And that was one of the starting points that we had this year as we started collecting stakeholder feedback. Some of the feedback was we had a variety of models, all great practices in their individual silos, but they needed to kind of come together and, and mesh in a way that made sense to teachers. Um, and then of course, seeing the results with students. So as we purposefully looked at the CREM model, the Henrico Learner Profile, the Deeper Learning Model, we realized all of those had tenets in our design, deliver, and assess model. And, and almost to the point Ms. Atkins brought up earlier, that learner-centered community, that was intentional. We know that our kids come to us with varied, various lived experiences, and they need to be challenged in certain ways. So we knew that was the underpinning of it all. And as we teased out the various components, we saw a good deal of overlap. And to be able to have a succinct model that really teased out these best practices. We wanted to kind of line them all up together and see where those overlaps were and bring them together in a, in a way that made the most sense. So when Ms. Seeley had up there the best practices, that is the result of almost a year's worth of reviewing input back out for review and getting it to the point where we feel like we have encapsulated um, best practices in the deeper learning model, learner profile and such in a way that teachers can design, deliver and assess. Well, and, and to me, it's, it's sort of right there in one spot. We can look when I'm preparing a, a lesson, when I'm working on a project based um, thing for my kids, whatever. Am I am I following this? Am I checking these boxes? And it's sort of a, a way for a teacher. It's sort of a check and balance sort of thing. I want to be sure that I'm doing these things. I'm, I'm hitting these uh, these goals for my students and from from beginning to end, which I think is great. But it also informs our parents 
a level of expectation, which I, I think they need. Um, so I appreciate that. I, but I also will echo what you said. It's student-centered. It is, and having the graduation cap, that's a, a continuation of that theme. But focusing on the five C's, especially the critical thinking and making our, our that higher level learning and thinking is where we want to go. We want to raise the bar, not lower it. But anyway, thank you so much um, for all the information. That, that's great. I appreciate it. Is that Ms. Iwern? Mm -hmm. I'm done. Thank you so much, Madam. Ms. Shea. Thank you so much. Um, I have a, a kind of a handful of questions that have a lot of meat to them. Before, but before I get to that, can we go to the slide that has the reporting timeline just for some clarity um, for my sake? Okay, um, so Dr. Hinton, under November, it says advanced course enrollment suspension. Please tell me those are two separate items. Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Uh, yes, we have separate metrics in our strategic plan. One is specifically around um, getting more of our students in, in involved in advanced coursework, and that really fits along with our typical presentation we do at that time of year with AP, SAT, right. and ACT data. And then um, we, there's also a metric in our strategic plan looking at um, suspensions, particularly in light of an equity index, and looking at that disproportionality. I just, for a moment, mistakenly read it as all one item and about fell out of my chair and like how did I miss this so uh, okay so it's two separate items. okay I'm good on that all right um, thank you for that point of clarification um, I'll just go in the order of the presentation if that's okay mr. Maddox first I want to thank you for all of your um, team's work, I mean, just tremendous work, especially in the last 18 months. I participated in a focus group um, yesterday with a dozen school mem board members from all over the country, and many of the divisions were talking about how they had just bought devices for the first time using um, relief monies, and they were so concerned to figure out how they were going to replace an entire division of infrastructure and um, devices on the same cycle, and that it was just going to, it just wasn't sustainable and it was going to be impossible. And so the forethought of your department on how to break it down into different cycles for devices and infrastructure, I think that's really what gives us a sustainable solution here here in Henrico that is so important. Um, just one question for you, you mentioned hotspots. Are families who had hotspots last year, did they turn those back in or um, did they keep them to use for this year? So the families that received a hotspot still have it, so we did not collect those. So they're still providing service today if they need it. Thank you. I, I guess my that's what I wanted to know. So that way, if there was some sort of emergency with a student um, needing to quickly um, pivot to distance learning because of quarantine, that infrastructure would be there. Correct. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Bostain, it is great to see you um, as we talk about um, kind of our access to um, technology instruction and um, you, you talked so beautifully about the Clever app that we use. I know that there are a lot of additional resources for Clever that don't necessarily show up on a child's page um, and even in the search bar um, don't show up. So I think one great example is Dr. Cashwell shared with the board um, in response to conversations at the last board meeting, um, utilizing Typing Club for our students and being able to do that. Um, so I, you know, searched in Clever, you know, Typing Club, just as an example, um, and it, it didn't populate into Clever. And I know there's some other resources like that as, as well. So um, kind of what's the, I guess, what's the barrier to get from the resources we've subscribed to, to getting to um, that aren't accessible to the Clever page, if that made sense at all? It, absolutely, okay. it does. And that is a great point of feedback and something centrally, we have a team that supports our Clever dashboard and it's a collaborative effort between uh, Mr. Maddox's shop and thus us over in teaching, learning and innovation. 
And through the work of our ILCs and our TSTs in the field, we have a reporting feature so that that can be shared back with us and we can explore and investigate why that resource is not showing up. I'm also pleased to share with the board that this year we will be, um, we're ending our exploration phase and we will be implementing Clever Analytics, where in addition to the resources that we do provision in Clever, we're actually gonna be able to see the other resources that our students and schools are engaging in, collecting data on that and make an informed decision from there. Thank you so much. I know it's a balance between overwhelming with so many icons that you can't find stuff and um, in, in open access. So th thank Absolutely. you for your continued work there. Dr. Baker, I think this is the first time I've gotten to like actually call you Dr. Baker. Uh, I know it's not but so new, but uh, it feels good to, to say it. So congratulations. Thanks. Um, as we look at our, you know, I think the education sector for a long time has had a challenge in staffing, both recruiting and retaining. Now nationally, we have um, across all, se all sectors or most sectors, a challenge with staffing. And then this year, we almost need more staff to pull off. And so, you know, it's kind of the trifecta of hard um, in terms of staffing. And I think as we move forward, we're gonna continue to need to be um, creative with how we recruit and retain. And so, um, this doesn't just pertain to you, but I think the whole kind of HR structure in general, I would really love to see us um, in being creative, really look into creating a structure around job sharing. Um, there are some positions it um, lends itself more easily to, like secondary and uh, secondary instruction. Other jobs it, it's a little more you know, challenging for, but I think we lose so many of our really passionate teachers in that, like five to 10 year frame um, that perhaps a job sharing opportunity would create, create more life balance for them and let us um, keep those um, employees in a part-time fashion. And then I think we're more likely for those part-time employees to then at some point return to full-time as well in terms of retain, not just retaining, but retaining some of our most passionate educators and really being creative with solutions. Um, and I think we're just gonna have to continue to get more creative as um, the teacher shortage is unfortunately not coming to an end. Um, and I love that um, the, you said the ALA has two tracks, one for administration and one for teaching, correct? Mm -hmm. And actually we have some good news on that, which I can have Dr. Weston come up uh, because we actually have some updates on ALA to even differentiate it even further. So this, is, this year will begin our fifth cohort of ALA. Uh, this started as a part of the Wallace Foundation grant that we partnered with Virginia State University five years ago. For this year, we actually are adding a third track to ALA and that will be our new leader track. So anyone who has not previously participated in ALA as a teacher leader, a new assistant principal uh, or a new associate principal will join ALA to have that year long experience. Great, thank you. And I think it's, I just wanna reiterate, it is so important, I think, to have the track to build leaders within the classroom and to build leaders into administration. I was at the pool this weekend, last weekend at the pool talking, you know, and some teachers were talking to me and um, one of them has been with the county for gosh, probably two decades, has, um, you know, a department chair, a lot of instructional leadership in her building, and she was um, sharing with me that people said, well, why don't you move into administration? Why? And she goes, because that's not where my passion is, right? That's not where I feel like I'm best serving kids, you know? And so teachers like this, that whose who's roots are in the classroom, and that's, that's where they want to stay, still giving them opportunities to grow as leaders and um, grow in their career without having to leave the classroom and follow the admin track is just so important. And so I will say you. that Henrico took the lead there. We have modeled our program again, working with the Wallace Foundations with several of school divisions across the country. We were the only one that had a focus on teachers leading from the classroom. Wow. Most only had the succession plan. And I think that's how we can, that's how we retain teachers in the classroom and not just in terms of retaining them as our staff, which we also wanna do, but retaining great teachers in the classroom for instruction. So thank you for y'all's forethought in that. 
And then my last question uh, for Ms. Stewart, um, you, you spoke a little bit about instructional coaches and can you just help articulate for me, is this different than ILCs? Uh, the ILC group is actually part of the instructional okay. coaches we have within the division. There's about 156 coaches across five different departments, uh, but they're all working on a unified coaching model. Okay, so ILCs are a subgroup of the larger instructional coaches. Correct. All right, that helps me understand. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Shea. Ms. Kinsella. Yes, I don't have many questions. I just appreciate any, any update on the strategic plan and where we are. As Ms. Ogburn said, it is critical and uh, to especially our organization. And most of the time it, it really does get ignored or it's one of the least popular discussions within an organization. So I'm grateful for today. Um, I like seeing partnerships mentioned in so many things we do. Uh, I believe in the partnership that supports our students. And as Mrs. Shea spoke quite a bit about um, as to our teachers, how to recruit them, how to reward them, how to help them grow uh, is important. Um, and I know our recent hire uh, to help us recruit, retain a more diver diverse workforce that looks like our students. Um, we're doing that. I have a question, and this might be Dr. Cashwell. Apologies to the presenters. Um, National Board Certification Program. This funding was restored, correct? That's correct. We were so grateful to the Henrico Education uh, Foundation during the time in which we uh, had to make some uh, budget cuts and freezes uh, during the initial stages of the pandemic. They stepped in to help support that effort. But yes, uh, we continue to fund that effort uh, internally and, and find it to be a critical part of uh, and a great investment when you look at the outcomes that uh, Dr. Baker shared. Okay, and that's been shared, and that's been shared with staff, with staff, so they're aware that the funding is available. Mm -hmm. Okay, it has been restored. Absolutely. Okay, I, I saw a hand or a peeking. <laughs> <laughs> that's a thumbs up and a head nod. That's, okay. a, that's <laughs> a yes, an official yes. Thank you very, thank you very much. As to the dashboard. Um, is this the dashboard for our division? And I'm sure, Dr. Hinton, is this the dashboard to show performance of the division um, and not stu individual student performance? Because we referenced quite a few dashboards this year. <laughs> yeah, so we, we are all about getting organized around our data, right? So we know how much data you're presented as a school board, our teachers are presented, our families are presented, and of course trying to make sure we keep things in an organized and understandable format. But yes, the, the dashboard that Dr. Hinton referred to in this presentation is related to a way we'll provide um, public transparent metrics related to our strategic plan. We've often presented you all data and we've uh, found places to put it, but we want to be really clear about um, how we're we're tracking our progress and our metrics towards achieving the, the, our bold goals in Destination 2025. So that's the dashboard reference here. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. Um, that's all I have at this time. Thank you so much, Ms. Kinsella. I have two just quick questions. Ms. Bostain, can you come to the mic real quick? Thank you so much for the presentation. On slide seven, um, um, HCPU, HCPSU, the online professional learning platform. Uh, could you tell me more about this? First of all, is it accessible to all HCPS staff, whether full or part time? It is accessible to all HCPS staff. And we started in back in 2019 with our HCPSU effort. So for the last two summers and ongoing throughout the school year, we're using that as our platform to deliver our professional learning. Thank you. Uh, are there any costs associated with the trainings? There are not, and I'll, I'll let Dr. Okay. Baker join okay. me right. on that on the professional learning side of this so I don't misrepresent yeah. that component. Yeah, no, there's no cost. It actually was cost neutral. We were able to handle it with the manpower that we had. We used it as kind of coming in at the beginning to just address the need of COVID because we had more professional learning we had to deliver on the fly last summer. Obviously, we had so many coming in summer of 2020 needing professional learning. Once we got the staff, uh, we had such great response to it from like internal surveys and things we were doing that um, they ended up, that, that kind of became our one-stop shop and it became a place where we can advertise the professional learning. And now we have things like equity, diversity, not 
opportunity on there. We're doing training for leading teacher teams and PLCs. So beyond COVID to continue to use this rather than it being one piece, uh, making it a, a, an area where teachers know where to go. So they have that support. So they're willing to stay in the classroom and can help support kids. No, that's awesome. I really appreciate that because I didn't want that to be prohibitive in regards to person's accessibility to the program. And last question on that section is for some of our professionals with licenses, um, would HCPS you offer any continuing ed courses that would fulfill those requirements? Well, on this, at the moment, not yet. Okay. Mostly what we have on uh, HCPSU are things that we have offered internally. Um, so we're not doing like the relicensure courses on there, though we do have the PowerSchool professional learning platform. And these are things that we are, uh, you know, working, of course, in collaboration with human resources and licensure to, to get those done. But right now, HCPSU is pretty much where the summer professional learning happens and then ongoing PL throughout the year that teachers would be um, using to support kids in building. Pretty much right now. Is it? Okay. So, so what, 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 what are our efforts in assisting with the continued ed courses to fulfill requirements? I'll let Dr. West in just to make sure we get that exactly right. So all of the courses on HCPSU and all of the professional learning that is provided for staff across the division counts towards their renewal or their relicensure points. So they are able to participate throughout the year, not only at the division level, right. but also at their school level to obtain the points that they need for relicensure. No, I appreciate that. Just again, that, that's very helpful in you know, us, again, assisting our staff in fulfilling and achieving and becoming everything they can be. And this first year we have power school professional learning and it's fully implemented in Henrico County where teachers can go on in real time and see their progress towards renewal. So they can always look at a transcript and see where they are and what is needed. And we can also recommend specific uh, professional learning opportunities, um, target different groups. Thank you, Dr. Weston, I appreciate that. Yeah. And Reverend Crippen, I was just gonna add uh, exactly to your point, the design of HCPSU was with our teachers in mind yep. and to continue to support to uh, not mm -hmm. only provide the multiple professional learning opportunities, but bring our coaching communities, our content together and have that on-demand access, as well as the seamless process that Dr. Weston just shared. No, thank you so much, Ms. Weston, I appreciate that. And 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 um, doctor, let me get it straight with uh, Ms. Shea, Dr. Baker, <laughs> since you're there. Um, on Slide 14, uh, recruiting, retaining diverse workforce. Um, I think it's, it's evident more than ever that this pandemic has highlighted the importance of placing such an intentional effort on staying competitive uh, in the market to be able to recruit and retain those critical positions such as bus drivers, nutrition staff, custodians, educators, counselors, counselors et cetera. Uh, everyone who are critical to making our school division a leader in the region because we wanna be that. Um, one approach you've discussed on recruiting, training, rewarding educators is developing pathways for professional learning and micro-credentialing. Um, outside of educators, could you speak to other efforts that the division is exploring to create creative or non-traditional pathways for recruitment and retention in other areas of our workforce, such as bus drivers, social workers, counselors that require certain endorsements or licensing? I see lots of people making a move and while they're coming up, I'll, I'll speak to some of that. So, um, you know, certainly for those who might be coming in new to Henrico County into any of those roles you mentioned, we want to make sure we're an attractive employer, not just because it's a great place to work and our salary and our benefits and those sorts of things are competitive, but that we offer professional learning for all of our employees in ongoing uh, ways. So, you know, we heard a lot in this presentation about what's offered for teachers and leaders, but outside of our instructional ranks, we do offer robust professional learning uh, opportunities. And so that's certainly something I think sets us apart perhaps from other school divisions. And then, uh, for example, we have a pathway where instructional assistants in our special education uh, classrooms can work towards obtaining uh, a degree in special education through the school division. We've been able to uh, garner interest there and create a pathway and, and help those folks attain that um, endorsement. So that'd be one example. I think there are many more that sort of speak to uh, what you've asked and, and Mrs. Bolden was coming forward, so I'll let her take that. 
And I'll just add one more. One of the things we're exploring for our non-certificated staff are things such as career ladders embedded within their job, and we're working with the county government to do that through our classification compensation system. And I appreciate that. We know about salary compression. We know about our career ladders, our intentional efforts. But to Dr. Cashway's point, I think that is so important for our staff and others in the community to know that we are diligent in our determination to invest in our employees. And being creative and, and creating those different pathways, I think, is essential because we do know how competitive the marketplace is. So I look forward to hearing more about that and mm -hmm. assisting in, in any way I can, we can, to make that happen. Thank you. No, thank you all. I'm sorry. Thank you all. Um, uh, Dr. Um, Hinton, I just want to say thank you on behalf of the board. Um, Ms. Kinsella and others have been so adamant about the strategic plan and the, the, the timeline that you have highlighted and illuminated gives us great direction on what's to come looking forward with anticipation, expectation, and excitement about that. So thank you so much for your presentation and for all the staff as well. Madam Superintendent. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again to um, all of our presenters and, and those of you who will have an opportunity to present in the future. We look forward to continued updates on this very important work. All right, uh, next on the agenda, there are a number of policies. The first one uh, is a uh, is a new revision for which I'm seeking uh, your approval outside of the 30-day review period, and then the others are uh, reviews for the first time. So for the first one, I am recommending that the school board waive the 30-day review period and approve the proposed revisions to policy P6-10-004, use of automobiles, and that is because this speaks to some specific uh, ways students are able to park at school, and so thus uh, asking for your uh, waiver of that 30-day period. Thank you, Madam Superintendent. Is there a motion to waive? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> no, that's okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Cashwell. I mm -hmm. wanted to just point out an important implication of this policy um, that Ms. Kinsella actually brought to my attention um, from the policy committee, which I appreciate, um, and that I've heard actually quite a bit of advocacy about in the last 24 hours, and that has to do with our ACE students yes. um, and transportation to and from our ACE centers and the um, large capacity of students on the buses. And so um, this would allow students at the ACE Center to get permission to drive between their home school and their ACE program, correct? Correct, following the procedures outlined in the policy, they'd be able to obtain that, yes. Wonderful, and that that is actually, for those students, this is a, this is a big change um, and um, will provide a lot more, I think, flexibility, as well as take some load off of our transportation. Um, if this passes uh, in just a moment, um, when could we expect to see the implementation of the policy? Uh, it, it would be effective as soon as the board meeting would be over and um, Dr. Tigan and Dr. Grant would be able to communicate with our schools uh, and let them know that the policy has taken effect and they could begin to put those procedures in place for students. Thank you so much. I'm done now. Yeah, Ms. Kinsella. If I may just add to what Mrs. Shea said, the, the, the timing of this, the reason the 30 days, uh, which we would normally have it for review and approval, because time is of the essence for our students to travel from school to school to participate in, the, uh, in special programs like ACE, um, in case anybody was wondering, that is why the 30 days has been waived, is so that this can benefit our students immediately. So thank you. Thank you. And seeing no more questions, uh, board members, is there a motion to waive the 30-day review period and approve proposed revisions to policy P6-10-004, use of automobiles? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Kinsella, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Shea, all in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, the ayes have it, the policy has been approved. Thank you very much. We'll make sure we communicate the, this new policy given its implications for our students. And uh, I would note that the following policies I won't be seeking your approval on until October 14th, but there are a number of uh, 
review or uh, revisions for your consideration. And again, thank our policy committee and all associated staff who have worked on continuing to bring these forward uh, to make sure that our policies uh, reflect any updated uh, references, changes, uh, and or current policy. So for the next pol um, one, I am, any questions for the board, from board rather, on policy P6-03-013, the enrollment of homeless students? Also um, have shared here, and it's available in board docs, uh, revisions to policy P6-19-023, audio video recording at special education meetings. Any questions here? Madam Superintendent, I have two on that one. Uh, can we make sure that we revise it to include legal guardian next to every mention of the word parent? I didn't, didn't see that in the revisions. Thank you. We'll make sure we're consistent with that change, uh, not only here, but anywhere else it may appear. We try to catch all of those. Yes. We, we must have missed one. We can, it's a good opportunity uh -huh. and why we bring them forward for a review by board members here and certainly uh, public review as well. On the next, um, one more. oh, yep. Also, could we one? look at expanding this policy to include language if students wish to audio video record at the IEP or section 504 meetings. We'll take that suggestion back to the policy committee and uh, look forward to bringing any updates. Thank you, Madam. That's all I have on that one. Um, also, um, offering an opportunity to answer any questions you might have about proposed revisions to policy P7-04-013, drug education. No? All right, also um, proposed revisions to policy P10-02-002, assistance to outside researchers. Okay, um, also proposed revisions to policy P10-02-003, criteria for research projects. All right, in that same theme, also recommending some revisions to policy P10-03, institutional research. Uh, Madam Superintendent, I did have one small minor change, if I may. Absolutely. Uh, just around in the sentence, uh, let's see, institutional research as requested by the school board and oh, the superintendent and his staff. I think we just wanna look at the pronoun. Thank you. Continue to get those as well. Great eye and a good catch. All right. Well, um, certainly we've taken note of the questions, comments, and suggested revisions, and we'll get those updated um, and continue to put those out for public review before seeking your approval again on October 14th. All right, next, I am recommending that the school board accept the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation grant award of $20,000. Is there a motion to accept the Virginia Department of Conservation and Recreation Watershed Education Grant Award? So moved. The move by Ms. Atkins, is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Ogburn, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it, the grant has been accepted. Thank you, next I'm recommending that the school board accept the Individual Student Alternative Education Plant Plan Grant Award funding of $49,397.38 from the Virginia Department of Education. Is there a motion to accept the Individual Student Alternative Education Plan Grant Award? So moved. It's been moved by Mrs. Shea, is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Atkins. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, the ayes have it. The grant has been accepted. Thank you. Next, I'm recommending the school board accept the Touring Assistance Grant Award of $6,900 to the Henrico County Public Schools Art Education Program. Is there a motion to accept the Virginia Commission for the Arts Touring Assistance Grant Award? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Second, second by Mrs. Shea. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, the ayes have it. The grant has been accepted. Thank you. Next, I'm recommending the school board accept the Middle School Teacher Corps Grant Award of $10,000 from the Virginia Department of Education to benefit Fairfield Middle School. Is there a motion to accept the Middle School Teacher Corps Salary Differential Grant Award? So moved. Been moved by Ms. Atkins. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Ms. Kinsella. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, the ayes have it. The grant has been accepted. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. And that concludes items from the superintendent. But before I uh, turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman, I do want to acknowledge that uh, while you, many of you already know uh, in the public viewing and our board members know that Andy Jenks is going to be leaving us soon. And this is officially his last board meeting with us in Henrico County Public Schools. And I know you all join me in wishing him all the best in his new chapter. And certainly I know Andy is probably known uh, best to many for his snow day uh, fun and certainly has left a legacy when it comes to um, all of the creativity, fun and joy he's brought uh, our student staff and the entire community at large in Henrico around snow days. His legacy goes far beyond that. And uh, certainly uh, the fingerprints of his work are left across many facets of the school division that go well beyond the school day. His creativity um, uh, when it comes to our communication strategy strategies um, in so many ways have left a lasting impact on us and, and to say he will be missed is an understatement. So if you all would join me in a final farewell and well wishes for Andy on his very last Henrico County Public Schools Board meeting, please. Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much, Madam Superintendent. And, and Mr. Jinks, we all echo um, uh, the sentiment shared by our superintendent. Um, you'll be gone, but you won't be forgotten. I know Ms. Uh, Mogburn and I have served the longest, and so we've spent the most time with you in this official capacity. Um, and I know our newer board members have become intimately involved with you as well the last two years. And so we do thank you, sir, for your commitment and for your hard work and we wish you Godspeed on your next chapter. Um, the next item on our agenda is the public forum, written comments. <laughs> and I will not be reading any names today. I will not <laughs> be reading any names today. Amen, no viral moments today. Um, citizens had until 4.30 p.m. Wednesday, September the 8th to submit comments for the board's review using a link on the HCPS website. Citizens took advantage of that opportunity, and we sincerely appreciate their input. Comments were compiled and provided to us prior to the start of today's meeting, and those comments have also been posted in board docs. So we wanna thank you for those persons who did take time to submit those comments. Next item on our agenda is our unfinished business. Board members, is there any unfinished business? Next is new business. Board members, is there any new business? Next section is the announcements and of meeting dates and the adjournment. But before I do that, I have been asked by two board members to share brief announcements. And so we're gonna start uh, with Ms. Atkins and then we shall proceed to uh, Ms. Ogber. So I wanna forewarn my colleagues because I do have something rather lengthy to say and I certainly want to take my time. Uh, it's certainly around What's at top of mind for me is back to school. And on yesterday, a lot of faith was demonstrated. Courage was displayed. Um, many folks just faced the unknown. And there was anxiety and excitement sharing the same space as so many staff, students, families, and whole communities experienced that first day of the 21-22 school year. And some were in person, some were virtual, some are being homeschooled, some selected homebound, and many were just watching. And I just want to say to Holland Springs, Sandston, and Verina, I am very, very proud of us. Uh, we are still in a pandemic, and we are using what we've learned to move forward while simultaneously making decisions while this pandemic continues to shift. We are continuing to empower ourselves by understanding legislation. I'm getting your phone calls. Continue to learn, particularly about Senate Bill 1303. We are stepping in to try to help our schools and our bus drivers, whether we're taking on trying to find ways to take our kids to school so that we can reduce some of the strain on our bus drivers. We are practicing safety protocols at home to try and keep each other safe. 
And I want to say that's something to be proud of. And sometimes it's those little things that add up into big things. And it's important to acknowledge that. I also just want to remind you that there is always a storm somewhere. Some folks experience storms for a season. Some folks experience that storm their entire life. And then there are some that are created from that storm. And I'm not talking about this, the uh, creation of birth of a baby or a human being. I'm talking about the birth of a new mindset. And I'm so proud that we are continuing to help one another, continuing to love one another, and continuing to grow through sharing concerns and ideas with each other, and I'm included in that. And so I give you a silent round of applause for continuing not only to help each other in your communities, but trying to find ways to help our schools. Because indeed, we're still in a pandemic. And while we've learned a lot, there's still so much more to learn. And it's going to take all of us to do that. And the first day of school was a wonderful, wonderful example of how to do that. And then I'll just close with a quote from one of my favorites, which is Lena Horne. It's not the load that breaks you down. It's the way in which you carry it. I want us to continue to help each other as we continue to learn how to carry this load, this pandemic. So colleagues, thank you for giving me the time to share my thoughts. Uh, it's, it's greatly appreciated. And that concludes what I have to say. Thank you so much, Ms. Atkins. Mrs. Ogburn. Um, just a, a quick thank you. Um, last week, um, the communication staff helped um, Mr. Brandon and I have a virtual community forum. And we decided to do our, our meeting this time virtual. We had a couple board members do there in person. We thought we'd give another option and have a virtual um, town hall, community forum, whatever you want to call it. But I'm just so grateful. We had over 270 people join in, which is a record for the three chop district. So I was really glad to see people come out. And I wanted to thank Dr. Tigan and Dr. Cashwell for answering questions. They were put on the spot and, and having a conversation and providing um, kind of what the community needed to hear. But a shout out to Mr. Jenks, for the last time, I'm sorry, and to Sean Gillihan for for their help with getting this done, and and to Adrian for moderating. It was it was great. I really appreciate the support, but um, hopefully we'll do it again soon. But I really do appreciate all the hard work. I know what goes into this behind the scenes doesn't just happen overnight. So thank you all for for making that possible. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Auburn. The school board's next meeting will be a work session scheduled on Thursday, September the 23rd, 2021 at 1 p.m. and a monthly meeting at 6.30 p.m. in the Newbridge Learning Center Auditorium. The meeting time may be adjusted if needed. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>